Good morning, everyone. We will get started in just a few minutes. If you'd like, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box so we know you are here. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Jeff. Good to see everyone. Hi, Denise. Hey, Ron. Hi, Cassia. Morning, Rebecca. Melissa, if you want to go ahead and get started, I will keep an eye on the waiting room. Um, and if you have any questions or haven't introduced yourself in the chat box, please drop a note there now. Great. Thanks, Roxy. Appreciate you monitoring everything for us today. Um, I believe I know most of you, but I am Melissa Vance. I'm the president and CEO of the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce. And it's always good to have you with us for these important conversations. And um, we are recording this today. So those that were unable to join at this time um, will be able to go back and watch it later. We'll post it on our page. So, um, and that's good for you to know as well in case you need to share this or would like to rewatch it in, in case you miss anything. Um, it is always a busy time of year, legislatively this time, and we are pleased to have with us again, representatives from the Indiana Chamber and the US Chamber talking about legislative priorities and some of the bills that are in the works some of the important work that our representatives are doing on behalf of Wayne County. So we have with us today, Adam Berry from Indiana Chamber and Ryan Gleason from the US Chamber. Thanks for being with us today, guys. Thank you for being here. Um, before we get started, I wanted just to let all of you that are with us know that um, if you haven't already seen the information, which I hope you have, Chamber Day at the State House is coming up on February 17th. That is an event that um, the Indiana Chamber Executives Association, the ICEA, hosts every year, which we're um, an active part of. And for the last several years, minus um, the COVID break, we have taken place. Um, taken part in that and carpooled over and spent the day over at the state house. So we invite you to join us for that. I think um, Lynette's going to put the link in the chat box for all of you to take a look at. And if you can join us, we'd love to have you. And then I know that evening, Indiana Chamber has their Chamber Day dinner going on. Adam, you want to say anything about that event before we get started? Yeah, actually, it's the second slide of my presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, Perfect. Say, yeah, and well, thank you for 
saving me some some of the money, giving me some time back. <laughs> no problem. Well, um, we'll let you cover that in just a second, but I wanted to um, just, again, thank you for being with us. And we're going to get started with Adam's presentation. We're going to let him share some of the legislative priorities that the state has going on. Then we'll transition and let Ryan speak. And we will do Q&A in the end. Anytime you have a question, you want to go ahead and type that in the chat box. Roxy will be monitoring that for us and we'll um, let her monitor and moderate the Q&A when we get to that point. If you have any questions, feel free to send us a note. With that, Adam, we're going to let you share your screen and get started. Great. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, just confirming that you all see my, you can see my screen. Okay. Um, well, yeah, so uh, just by quick introduction, my name is Adam Berry. I'm Vice President of Economic Development and Technology here at the Indiana Chamber. Um, sort of the way our team works is there are five lobbyists or five vice presidents who all work uh, with Kevin. Uh, so my portfolio uh, really is sort of the economic development, um, tech, talent attraction uh, type initiatives. Um, as Melissa referenced, we do have our, our Chamber Day event coming up. Uh, February 15th. JC Watts is the uh, speaker that evening. Um, just do a quick Google search and you'll you'll sort of understand how um, how how fortunate we are to have JC as, as our featured speaker that evening. Um, former Oklahoma State quarterback, uh, congressman uh, should be a should be a great great event. Um, so this presentation uh, is really structured as a legislative preview. So um, what I'm going to do is kind of go through uh, some of the workforce uh, and worker surveys that we um, that we, we did last year to kind of tease up what our legislative priorities are, are going to be. I'm going to go through all of this uh, relatively quickly just to save time for Q&A because as I mentioned, it's set up as a preview presentation. And so if there are questions about, uh, you know, sort of bills that are moving um, and, and questions you have there, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do my best to field those or at least uh, put you in touch with the appropriate person. So as mentioned, uh, last year we did a workforce survey, 14th annual workforce survey and our first ever worker survey. Uh, and, and the general theme uh, that we learned from our, our worker work, uh, employer survey is that uh, employers are optimistic about the future. Nearly two thirds um, think that Indiana has a strong business climate. However, most believe, um, and, and most believe that their financial situation would be better, better a year from now. Nearly three fourths think that the state is headed in the right direction. However, um, more than half uh, think that the country is headed in the, in the wrong direction. Um, Here's, here's something that'll come, that'll come up later. Um, so just put a pin in this, remember this, that mostly uh, employees uh, are confident uh, in the security uh, of, their, uh, of their job. Um, so the key takeaway from our employer survey, uh, there are five. The first one is that Indiana, uh, Indiana has a workforce talent shortage, uh, despite the positive outlooks that I just referenced, 85% um, of employers say meeting their talent needs uh, is, a, is a challenge. And 67% say the biggest obstacle uh, we employers currently face uh, is, is the lack of talent, talent uh, quality, uh, qualified workers. Um, where you can see this come into play is that, so 72% of employers say that the supply of applicants does not meet their needs, which is up significantly um, from, from previous uh, surveys. And, and interestingly, 60% of employers left job, uh, jobs open due to a lack of underqualified applicants, which is also up. The second key takeaway is that uh, our skills gap um, persists and, and will persist for this foreseeable future. Um, Hoosier employers think uh, the biggest challenge to getting back to normal um, will be keeping current employees uh, or hiring new ones. And 
this is another one that will come up here in a second. 58% um, uh, they expect to increase their workforce, which is a huge increase. And, and this, is, this is great news, is that half of our employers uh, say that the company is likely to add higher paying jobs over the next two years. Um, and uh, I told you to remember that about uh, individuals feeling secure in their jobs. Well, 70%, 72% uh, expect to look for a new job opportunity in the next year. The third key takeaway is that uh, employers are trying to upskill up their workforce and they want the state to help even more. 60% um, say that they want the state to provide financial incentives to, to workers uh, with high, post high school degrees or cred credentials to relocate to Indiana. I have sort of mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, um, I absolutely feel like an incentive to uh, attract talent to the state is critical. And in fact, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you later about a, a bill that I, I'm working on um, that does that is aimed at, at just at just that. But I, I feel like it, it's also um, with with a different, I don't want to say handouts, but the different programs that the state has established, <clears throat> I think employers are starting to feel uh, almost reliant upon the state uh, to help them uh, sort of direct them and pay for them to, to increase their uh, the skills of their workers, uh, which I'm not necessarily saying is a bad thing. Uh, I'm just saying that the dependence, we, we just can't be as dependent on the state um, to always have money available uh, to get our employee, our workforce where it needs to be. Uh, the fourth key takeaway is that employers need better resources for training and hiring and, and program awareness. Um, and I want to make you all aware of a program here at the chamber. Uh, it's a talent resource navigator. Uh, it's funded by a, a large grant, the Lilly Endowment. And the idea is more or less a one-stop shop uh, to marry um, those in the workforce, uh, those students who are looking for jobs, um, as well as employers accessing the talent and helping to navigate and vet um, the talent that they, that they are considering hiring. And finally, many workers uh, who lack post-secondary credentials recognize that they need more education or training to advance their career. 39% uh, say that their current uh, education level um, or skill level uh, is a barrier um, to progressing in, in the workforce. Um, and this is in, something I found interesting is 58% have considered more education in the past two years, uh, but 20% uh, have seriously considered. And what I, I feel like um, we need to do is not only uh, help employers with uh, helping to scale up the workforce, but we need to make those resources and educate our workforce uh, to what is available uh, to them, either through the employer or through the state, uh, to really help them skill up, uh, increase their wages, and increase, increase their skill sets. Um, one third of workers believe a high school diploma is all you need for a thriving career. Uh, this is probably the most astonishing uh, uh, I guess, res poll result. Um, one third think that high school diploma is all you need for a thriving career. Uh, but they are wrong. Um, in March 2021, 916,000 jobs were added to the economy. Of those, less than 1% were just 7,000 jobs were for people with only a high school diploma. So as I mentioned, these are, these are survey results. They help uh, inform us as lobbyists. They also help inform our policy committees uh, for where employers and employees uh, collectively feel like we should pursue policy changes at the state house. Um, 2020, the 2022 session uh, is off to a very fast start. For those unfamiliar with the legislative process, there are short sessions and then there are long sessions. Long sessions are our budget sessions uh, where we set a two-year budget. Short sessions 
Uh, there are, for the most part, uh, no uh, money appropriations uh, to agencies or to different programs. Uh, but in the current climate, uh, you'll see legislation uh, like House Bill 1002 that's, uh, that is wanting to be, be what uh, Doc Brown calls the largest ever uh, tax cut. Um, and then there are a few bills that are appropriating money. But for the most part, this is a short session, which means everything is really expedited. Uh, and we're focusing on policies and initi initiatives that don't have a dollar amount, uh, a spending amount attached to them. So what I'm going to talk about are the key legislative priorities for the Indiana Chamber as we were going into this session. And some of that's changed. Um, and But for the most part, um, this is where my, me and my, my colleagues and I have really been spending the bulk of our time. We'll first start off with um, something I'm sure you've all heard a lot about uh, in the recent weeks is uh, the, the, the chamber opposes government mandates um, that prevent uh, businesses from making their decisions about whether or not their workforce uh, should be vaccinated. Um, and why this is important is that uh, employers are really in the best position uh, to determine what's best for them, for their workforce. And also this is um, something that employers, you know, to attract talent from other states, I mean, you know, um, it's, it, it's a detriment to that. So really sort of autonomy as far as our employers are concerned from, from uh, uh, the state meddling in, in these business decisions. Um, our, as I mentioned, sort of our, our you know, the top concerns are that uh, legislative intrusion into our um, into the vaccination decisions, a, a new testing tax, which uh, is actually in the House passed version of, of House Bill 1001, where uh, an alternative to uh, uh, back the employee getting vaccinated <clears throat> are weekly tests that are uh, the cost of which are incurred by employers. And then um, it broadens religious exemptions, which you know, it, it get kind of this kind of gets into some some touchy issues. Anytime you're talking about uh, this well-established discrimination and um, and sort of these protected class issues. Uh, second area. Oh, oh and, and by the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through and as I mentioned each of these, I'll if I remember, I'll, I'll mention the lobbyist uh, who's sort of quarterbacking the issue. Uh, so if you have questions about certain initiatives, um, you know who to contact here at the chamber. So the previous one, Kevin, is really um, quarterbacking the House Bill 1001 issue on behalf of the chamber. Uh, this is my area. Um, so the second priority for us is attracting remote workers. Um, we, we support establishing incentives for attracting remote workers and, and workers generally to the state. Uh, I'm going to skip over this real quick because I'm going to come back to it on, on, in my final slide, um, as well as this one too. We promote on <coughs> entrepreneurship, should be no surprise. Um, the Kauffman Foundation, perennially ranks Indiana uh, really in the bottom 10 of states uh, in terms of new business creation. Uh, and we just need to do more to help uh, increase access to capital, mitigate risk for potential entrepreneurs. Uh, and um, create a, a, an environment, a place here in Indiana uh, that is attractive to those who want to who want to go out on their own. Um, education workforce. This is my colleague Jason Bierce. Um, we support measures to enhance early child child care access and quality. This is really no surprise. Um, this is a this is an issue really everywhere, uh, but especially here in Indiana. Um, the lack of affordable uh, child care across India is, is one of the outside, uh, is, is really a factor um, to, as I, you know, this previous slide of, of attracting talent to our state um, and entrepreneurship. Um, college and career, career readiness, this is also, this is also Jason. Um, we support strengthening college and career readiness for, for our Indiana students. Um, we have talent and quality uh, worker shortage, which, um, as I mentioned in my in my opening uh, half of the presentation, uh, is significant um, concern by both employers 
uh, and employees. I will mention though, um, that the positive uh, statistic came from some research that we did uh, with our Indiana report card, uh, Vision 2025 report card, which showed that uh, we're now only 1% of our high school graduates who go to college require remediation in reading and math, uh, which is down from 11% uh, just a few years ago. So we are making some progress in this area. Uh, energy and, and environment, uh, my colleague Greg Ellis uh, really oversees this, this policy area. Um, we support a renewable energy standard, a statewide standard that removes certain siting barriers for renewable energy. Um, you see this played out, really it played out a lot last session where it's sort of a, um, a battle between local control uh, and, and uh, state legislators. Um, taxation and public finance, the Indiana Tax Court must remain an independently operating uh, judicial court of special jurisdiction. Um, there's talk about eliminating the tax court and sort of having these cases just go into uh, circuit courts or trial courts. Uh, and why this is so important um, is that if a case gets to the tax court, then there is reason to believe that the, uh, the individual who's brought that case has a valid claim. Um, you know, you, 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 at the agency, you know, administrative review, um, there's an opportunity for agency review, but the tax court is really critical to have a objective uh, third party with subject matter expertise evaluating these claims with, that a claimant has, you know, paid attorney's fees to take it through the process. So we do not want to lose that subject matter expertise when it comes to uh, tax cases. Um, we still need to reduce the dependence on, on business personal property tax. Um, this, this is a, uh, another very um, issue that I could spend a long time talking about. But in essence, you know, Indiana is regarded as having a very friendly uh, tax climate and, a, and business attractiveness. Um, you know, taxes on business a lot less than the other states. Um, however, uh, what gets lost in the conversation is this conversation about personal uh, business, personal property and property taxes, um, which because of the, of the rate that they are charged, um, in totality, Indiana's tax climate uh, is, is really harmed uh, by that high tax rate. So um, in sort of the structure of it, this is my, my colleague, Bill Waltz, um, as with the tax court uh, policy position. Um, he's been working on this issue for years, um, but it, it looks like we're making some progress uh, this session. Also in that House Bill 1002 that I was talking about is, is the largest ever um, tax cut. So more, stay tuned for that. Uh, this falls into my portfolio. Uh, we support an, an expansion of research and development, uh, manufacturing, testing, deployment of electric vehicles. Um, there's no question that the EV revolution is, is, uh, is upon us. Um, it's projected that by 2025, 10% of all vehicles sold uh, will be EV. The number is to increase over 50% by, by 2040. Uh, finally, workers' comp. Uh, this falls into Mike Ripley and uh, Kevin's portfolio. Um, chamber supports cap reimbursement for ambulatory, uh, ambulatory surgical centers. Um, sort of a complicated issue, but basically, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, capping those, uh, capping the work comp uh, reimbursement um, rates to Medicare will will um, it provide for increased benefits. As basically, what we just are trying to keep costs under control uh, with it because they're they're not right now, which impacts employers. Uh, across the board in terms of our work comp rates. So I wanna highlight three bills, uh, which are my legislative priorities, all of which are moving through the session, uh, through the process. Senate Bill 4 um, is, is a bill, uh, it's, it's called the Workforce Retention 
uh, and recruitment uh, program and fund. Essentially what we're saying is that local units of government, uh, cities, towns, counties, uh, school corporations can identify money that are sitting in all these accounts that might have use of, use of funds, uh, prohibitions on them. They can identify money that are, that's unused surplus that are sitting in those accounts and move a portion of them into a workforce fund. Money in the workforce fund can be used to either market the community um, to out-of-state residents or just sort of, sort of highlight the attractiveness of the community or the money and or the money can be used to offer incentives uh, to individuals and families to locate in that community. Uh, individuals qualify one of three ways, either a recent college, uh, Indiana College University grad, uh, an out-of-state employee uh, who the unit wants to uh, attract to relocate or locate into the community, or an existing resident of the community who intends to move uh, out, of, out of state. And there are a lot of uh, guardrails and, and other, so I'm happy to answer questions about that, but uh, this goes a long way to kind of giving some local control uh, to attracting and retaining uh, much needed talent. Senate Bill 361 is the IEDC's, Indiana Economic Development Corporation's agency bill, um, which sort of revamps a lot of the uh, tax credit incentives that are available to our employers, sort of removes the caps and adds a comprehensive aggregate cap of $600 million, uh, really giving more flexibility to the IEDC. It establishes a remote worker program uh, at the state level. Uh, and then also it creates these innovation districts. And I, basically it's kind of like a, a region, that, a state TIF district. Uh, look for that portion of the bill to be amended uh, on Thursday. Th th that receives some controversial attention, um, overlapping TIFs, et cetera. So um, that one's not ironed out completely. And, and, but we are more concerned about the first two parts of it, uh, more flexibility in terms of incentives and also the remote worker program. And then finally, Senate Bill 401, uh, which is going to be heard in committee this week. I work very closely with um, with Senator Houch and in drafting the bill as I did with Senator Holdman on Senate Bill 4. Um, Senate Bill 401 uh, redefines uh, venture capital investment funds uh, that are eligible for a tax credit to investors uh, to really identify and help those organiza organizations that are supporting early stage companies. Um, and it also, if the IEDC runs out of tax credits, the venture capital investment tax credits, then it makes discretionary funds available to continue the program. Uh, so more to come on those as well. Finally, uh, I, I wanted to, we, we wanna make you aware that our legislative directory is available. Contact me afterwards if you're interested in this. Um, there's also an app available as well. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. I appreciate uh, you inviting me today. Um, I know I went through things quickly, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the end. So again, thank you. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate all of that. I know I was taking a lot of notes, um, even though I listened in on a lot of your calls, I still was taking a lot of notes. So I have a few questions of my own, but we'll save those to the end. And at this time, we will transition to Ryan um, to hear a little bit about what's going on in Washington. Sure, sounds good. Thanks, Melissa, for having me. I hope the Wayne County Area Chamber is doing all right. I know we were supposed to meet in person a few weeks back, uh, but unfortunately, the ongoing pandemic seems to have uh, taken care of that instead. So I'm going to share my slide deck with you. Um, so to kind of just give you a quick perspective, and it was good to hear from you, Adam, uh, you and the team led by Kevin in Indianapolis, things moved much faster in state capitals. And so you guys have a robust, uh, flexible team that are catching everything along the way, whereas in Washington, uh, things seem to be working a much, much slower pace. Uh, a little bit about the U.S. Chamber and the area that I work in. I work in our Great Lakes Regional Office that uh, covers Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, 
Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Kentucky, working with uh, members of Congress, uh, Senate, uh, on business issues that uh, affect the nation as a whole, but particularly here in the Great Lakes. Uh, we're a team of three individuals. Uh, Kevin Courtois and myself are based out of here in Chicago, and I and I believe my colleague Laura Mannion, who is based in the Philadelphia uh, area, is on as well. So what I'd like to do first before going into uh, the rest of this last session of this 116th Congress is to look back at some of the key uh, legislative outcomes that happened last year in Congress and then what to look forward to uh, this year in Washington, both in ways that the U.S. Chamber are going to be playing uh, offensively and defensively on some key pieces of legislation, some of which have already began uh, only about three and a half weeks into this new year. And then obviously this year is a midterm election. I uh, kind of want to give you an update of what that looks like, what the state of play is, and potentially how that's going to impact uh, the new Congress come January of 2023. So I won't get into all the specifics, but last year it was a new year, obviously, and with that coming off the 2020 election, uh, there was a new Congress and a new president, but really when the new year began, it was really difficult to see what was going to happen in Congress. Democrats had a uh, slim majority in the House and in the Senate, there were two runoff races uh, in Georgia, if you recall, at the beginning of uh, January. Uh, both Democrats, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff, won those Senate elections, giving the Senate a 50-50 a split with new Vice President Kamala Harris being the uh, casting tie vote in many cases in the Senate, kind of really keeping her in Washington, uh, which I'll touch on here in a little bit more uh, further. And then unfortunately, we saw some of the worst uh, aspects of our country with the January 6th insurrection, uh, but we made it through that and President Biden took office on uh, January 26th as the 46th president uh, last year. Now, last year, around this time, and much similar to this time, the pandemic was still ongoing and things needed to get done. President Biden is actually as a result of one of his first actions in office was to uh, have the United States re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, but in order to get something done legislatively, President Biden knew that the pandemic uh, and the virus were really on the forefront of uh, and the American people's lives, which I'll touch on here, which was in part a win for the for the U.S. Chamber. And so what he had done is he had passed uh, the American Rescue Plan, and I'll dive into some of the uh, wins of that for the U.S. Chamber that we had had. Uh, and so he signed that into law on March 11th. As the summer kind of went on, uh, legislative uh, items really stalled. Uh, we did see the president begin to roll out what his version of the Build Back Better plan is, which I'll go into further detail, or at least the initial proposals of that. However, where things really began to change, uh, we're really in the month of August, uh, which I'll show you according to polling results and how that may affect the midterm elections in 2022. And many pundits believe that as a result of President Biden's plan of exiting Afghanistan, there was a real shift uh, in the public electorate with regard to how they view who should be in office and the president's approval numbers. But arguably the biggest thing for the biggest for the business community and for the US Chamber was when President Biden signed into law that $1.2 trillion uh, bipartisan budget or infrastructure plan that I'll go into great length and detail. This was a great legislative win for the chamber community and passed in a bipartisan fashion. On November 19th, uh, the House strictly on party line votes with only one Democrat voting against the president's social spending plan, the Build Back Better plan passed it. Uh, it's a two, it was a $2.2 trillion climate action and social spending plan uh, that ultimately went to the Senate uh, and essentially is on life support. And we'll discuss and how uh, different vehicles may move it forward. But unfortunately, we saw the year close out 
uh, with a death toll of the coronavirus hitting 800,000 people and still climbing today, doubling from its toll earlier in the year. So first, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, there were some wins in this for the chamber, and there were things that we were playing for this offensively, defensively. Uh, first, it was a $1.9 trillion plan. And as we saw, vaccines began to get out there. We realized that they weren't getting out fast enough. Uh, so there were billions of dollars vaccine tri uh, distribution for testing and contact tracing. Obviously, we wanted to see uh, our children get back into the schools, but back in a safe uh, way. Uh, but then additionally, there, there were those stimulus checks as well. Now, President Biden had ran on a $2,000 stimulus check for uh, most Americans that was debated back and forth because there was a plan, uh, the sixth installment that passed in December of 2020. $600, and so the mentality there was to get to $2,000 both with that. But one of the bigger wins that we saw from the U.S. Chamber uh, when, when it was March of last year, we did see that unemployment insurance was still uh, necessary for the average American individual that was having a tough time returning to work. However, the question was, what was that threshold going to be? Originally, what the president's plan for the American Rescue Plan was a 600 uh, per week uh, increase, supplemental income. Uh, that was debated down to $400, ultimately down to $300. But what we ultimately saw is for business owners uh, finding a difficult time getting uh, uh, their workers back to work, especially as vaccines began to roll out successfully and more uh, successful COVID. Uh, protection implementations were put into place. That expired at, in September of last year. Perhaps more importantly, for particularly small businesses, uh, we saw additional money for PPP. We saw expanded uh, industries and sectors such as 501c6s, 501c5s, labor uh, sort of industries be uh, admitted into the Paycheck Protection Program, which was that successful implementation through the CARES Act uh, way back in March of 2020 when uh, the pandemic struck. And then we saw additional funding for airlines and restaurant industries. You know, those are the industries that really were suffering the most. So all in all, we saw through the American Rescue Plan roughly $1 trillion in direct relief, $480 billion in business, state, local, and tribal relief uh, that hopefully the Indiana Chamber and the Wayne County Area Chamber work with your local leaders, state leaders, uh, Indiana, to make sure that that money was uh, spread out as appropriately as possible. And then also, as mentioned, additional $400 billion for vaccines testings and testing in schools. But really the bulk of the biggest success of last year, and as I mentioned, things were very slow in Washington, uh, specifically as you contract in state capitals and uh, city councils, was the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, this was one of the biggest priorities for the chambers, not only the past couple of years, but uh, really this was 25 years in the making. And so kind of a timeline of how all this rolled out. Even before March 21st, uh, we at the U.S. Chamber at the beginning of the year began our own campaign called uh, Build by the Fourth of July, uh, trying to uh, force Congress's hand to pass a comprehensive, hard, traditional infrastructure plan by the 4th of July. Uh, we had uh, over uh, thousands of uh, trade associations and businesses and uh, chambers sign on. But really what happened, as mentioned, the president released his original proposal for the uh, Infrastructure and Jobs Act back in March. There were things in there, particularly related to raising the corporate tax rate other sort of tax rates that would have affected businesses across the nation. Uh, as we saw in Washington, uh, between April and May, uh, Republicans went back and forth with different proposals. Uh, but ultimately, the Senate uh, decided to move forward in July and uh, bringing it up for a vote. And we saw in August 
of 2021 in a Senate vote in a bipartisan fashion, particularly with a 50-50 split. Uh, we saw the Senate pass the measure by a 69-30 vote threshold. Uh, so we had 19 Republicans that uh, moved across uh, the aisle to pass this measure in a bipartisan fashion. But ultimately what we saw in November is that the, uh, the House took up the bill. Uh, we still saw a number of Republicans reach across the aisle and get this measure passed. And so ultimately this law was signed uh, into nature or into law by the president on uh, November 15th of last year. So we went from a legislative phase to an implementation phase. So what was in this package? As I had mentioned, it was hard infrastructure. It was uh, hundreds of billions of dollars for roads and bridges and other major pro uh, projects. In fact, we saw about a week and a half ago, the president in uh, the administration detail where uh, specific state bridges will be uh, be affected by this. We saw $70 billion, billion through the electric grid. Uh, we saw $65 billion put into broadband, and particularly in the rural, rural communities that were probably hit hardest the most as it related to broadband, especially when students had to uh, be taught from home and parents were working from home. Uh, rural communities really needed it the most. Additionally, we saw uh, billions of dollars for public transit for airports, waterways. Uh, and then we saw the president kind of detail specifically uh, for electronic vehicle charging stations. Is, uh, we're going to see that more and more as uh, uh, the normal way of uh, uh, getting across uh, you know, our, our, our roads uh, as we move forward in the 21st century. But the baseline investments for the Infrastructure and Jobs Act by sector was $284 billion for transportation, about $55 billion for water, $65 billion for, uh, for broadband, and then you can see the rest down the line there uh, as well. But then the president uh, kind of put out his Build Back Better plan, which he tried to pitch as a uh, more human infrastructure plan. Uh, this passed the House, as mentioned, on uh, November 19th on a party line vote. Uh, so what was included in the proposal? Uh, $381 billion worth of universal pre-K, $119 billion for paid family and sick leave, you know, child tax credits, home health care, affordable uh, uh, care act subsidies, Medicare, Medicaid uh, services, Pell Grant, affordable housing. These, all th these are things that sound great. Uh, but unfortunately, right around this time, this is when we saw really inflation take a stranglehold uh, on the average American. Uh, we've seen it in grocery stores where every sort of produce and home good have gone up, uh, the rising price of gasoline. But the key thing is it related to the Build Back Better plan is none of this needs to get done immediately. And with uh, major issues in Washington, this should be done in a bipartisan fashion. As mentioned, this was only done on a partisan uh, line vote. And we feel like at the chamber from our perspective, and this is how we'll touch on in a little further, how this measure could be, uh, or issues like these could be broken up. So where does the Build Back Better stand? So first, this was tied to a budget reconciliation. Uh, without that, it would need 60 votes in order to pass the Senate. Really, there are two key votes uh, in the Senate, two Democrats in the Senate. First, the most arguably the most vocal uh, uh, senator was Senator Joe, Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia. His biggest issue, quite frankly, was the amount of spending that was going to be related to the Build Back Better plan. You know, and a big concern of his is, quite frankly, how much money as a result of uh, COVID-related spending, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act spending uh, that was really affecting inflation. And as we move forward, 
into 2022 and through 2022, we really don't see uh, how COVID is going to affect uh, the country as we move forward. As I mentioned, we had seven installments, uh, COVID relief spending packages. Uh, are we going to need a ninth additional spending? So Senator Manchin, right before uh, Christmas, essentially said that he's not going to vote in favor of this, that he's more open to potentially uh, different sort of versions of this Build Back Better uh, moving forward. And so this kind of fell by the wayside. And so the next steps is that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer insisted that negotiation of the bills will continue until the uh, bill is passed. But it's going to be difficult for Democrats to determine a path forward for the bill. Because quite frankly, uh, much like the Republican Party, Democrat Party is is, is quite frankly split. Uh, you have members like Senator Manchin that would like to see a much smaller version of the bill uh, take place, but then you have senators like uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren who doesn't want to see a bill that doesn't include child care or health care pr provision services. The Build Back Better plan also too was originally a three and a half trillion dollar plan when the president first put out his proposal for it. Through negotiations uh, and ways through the House, it became a $1.75 trillion plan. Uh, Senator, uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders said he doesn't want to see any further cuts to it. So it's going to see it difficult uh, for uh, with a such a slim majority of it being a 50-50 Senate with the vice president being a tie vote of how you really see a coalition of essentially Senate Democrats moving this forward. So what are we going to focus on as we enter into the 2020 year? Uh, well, first and foremost, for voting rights we've already saw happen. Uh, and we'll touch on the specific of what those voting rights are. Uh, the Senate Majority Leader Schumer hoped to carve out an ex exception for a filibuster to essentially uh, get rid of that 60 vote threshold because it'd be uh, impossible to tie uh, really this uh, voting rights to any sort of reconciliation. But again, de Democratic senators such as Sen uh, uh, Kristen Sinema of Arizona and Joe Manchin publicly said and, uh, that they're against uh, putting ending the filibuster. Uh, Senator Sinema said in a pretty impassioned uh, floor speech, uh, a few days ago that that this wouldn't be the cure of fixing the disease. Uh, instead, if you were to get rid of the filibuster, that is the core of the stagnation really in Washington, because uh, what you would see is every two years, the political winds swing and you'll have Republicans uh, have the majority every two years and then Democrats have the majority every two years. So what you would see are these big pieces of legislation where you're not working across the aisle and such pieces of legislation going from one way to another. And certainly what the business community would like to see is forms of stability. Additionally, the social spending is how we'll see how the uh, package uh, potentially moves forward with this, the Build Back Better and how that uh, potentially is broken down. Uh, FY22 uh, appropriations, the, bub uh, the government runs out of uh, spending on February 18th. We're going to see if uh, there's a continuing resolution. I would find it hard to believe in a political year uh, that both the House and the Senate Republicans and Democrats couldn't come together in this form. Uh, because quite frankly, when the government shuts down, no one wins. And then we're seeing bipartisan support for boosting competition in China. Uh, additionally, what we would like to see from the chamber's perspective is to see this administration get more involved in uh, trade relations, particularly as it relates to the UK and other European friends. And real workforce development, we're not seeing that at a federal level, and so I'm glad to see that uh, states, particularly like in Indiana, are, are going to be tackling this. So quickly, just to note, and I know that we're running out of time here, so I'll try and get past so we can take questions. The, the voting for Freedom Act, the John R. Lewis Act, this was blocked. Uh, this took together a lot of different pieces of voting legislation. So to ensure at a federal level that same day voting registration could happen, online registration. 
But essentially what this would do would federalize all sorts of voting, uh, essentially taking away a lot of state rights. Uh, uh, this is something that at the chamber we thought is more appropriate at the state level. And again, uh, this was blocked in the Senate a few days ago, uh, particularly uh, through a passion speech through Kristen Cinema. So let's quickly look here at the president's approval ratings by party and how this affects going into an election year. As you can notice, uh, right around August is kind of a steep decline with independence. When the president took office, there was, he had a 61% support of independence. That's nearly been cut in half to 33%. And so that's going to be very difficult moving into a midterm election. Uh, as we can see here through Real Clear Politics, uh, uh, who is kind of an aggregator of polling throughout the country. And then uh, 538, who uses different election models. Again, as we can see, right around that time in August, the president's approval ratings across the nation have really fallen and stayed below 50%. Again, a not a very good indicator uh, for moving into a midterm election. Let's see where the president's administration is two years or into their second year. You can see it about a 40% approval rating. President Trump, uh, not much better or much worse off at a 38% approval rating. And you go down the line and you kind of see how that affects, we'll touch on how that affects um, what it looks like moving in into a midterm election. And as I had mentioned, the House is very closely split with Democrats having roughly a 10 seat advantage. And then in the Senate, it's a 50 50 split. And as a result of this, this is where you want to see bipartisan action done. And that's where you see success, such as the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. And this is the longest since 2002 the Senate has had a 50 50 split. So, as I mentioned, Kamala Harris really always has to be on standby as it relates to nominations and other key pieces of legislation to go in there and vote should there be a 50-50 split. Really, let's see the historical trends in elections, particularly it relates in the House. And so President Trump, when he was in office for his first term in 2018, we saw Republicans take a 40 seat loss. In 2010, we saw uh, really Democrats with Barack Obama in office uh, take a very shellacking 63 seat low loss. So we'll see how that affects moving forward. In the Senate, it's a little bit more of a jump ball. Uh, we'll see how that works with Republicans having gained in 2018. In 2010, uh, Democrats lost six seats there. So the voters are really divided in how, which party takes over uh, Republican or for House control. Right now, Republicans, as you can see, really uh, kind of have a slim majority of taking back the House. But the key, you know, the factors that will decide that is redistricting and how that looks. I know that Indiana set their maps. The political environment, as I mentioned, the president's approval ratings have really re steadily remained under 50%. Uh, Senate retirements, we're starting to see 28 Republic Democrats retire from the House, and 13 Republicans retire from the Senate. Uh, national recruitment of uh, the sort of the individuals that will be running for these House seats, both in the House and the Senate. And turnout dynamics, where midterm, uh, midterm primaries tend to more benefit uh, white older individuals, which uh, have a track record voting more for uh, Republicans, but it also increasingly has more uh, college educated voters that come out and vote, which tend to, in recent history, focus on Democrats. We see there are six open Republicans or six open Senate seats, uh, particularly in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, which Laura and I are focused on. Obviously, your Senator uh, Todd Young is up for reelection in Indiana this year. Uh, it's widely assumed that his seat is relatively safe. And there's one seat open in the Senate. That's in Vermont with outgoing Senator Patrick Leahy retiring. Quickly here, a couple of just polling. We're starting to see more and more as we see more polling. We're happy to keep you abreast uh, of polling in the Senate. And so then lastly, the party affiliation polling is really shifted. And some of the key takeaways is that now um, uh, almost a majority of uh, uh, individuals uh, 
affiliate themselves with Republicans. That is a big change of where we were uh, when the president took office. And so that really is uh, a kind of a gloomy outlook for Democrats as we head into the midterm elections. And really what the president's legislative agenda would be in a new Congress, should there be Republican takeovers in the Senate and in the House. And I know that I kind of went a little quicker there at the end, Melissa. And so I just want to turn it back to you. and Thank you for your time and any questions that there might be for, for Adam or myself. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate that. So I want to um, give you all a chance to type your questions into the chat box if you haven't already done so, and Roxy will be monitoring that. In the meantime, I want to go back up to the um, to some of my notes and find a question or two. Um, one of the questions I had for you, Adam, was, I know the state, and you talked about this a little bit in how we make ourselves um, competitive in attracting workers, especially remote workers to the area or retaining people who plan to leave. And so a couple of questions that surround that. Um, first being, with Indiana looking at this, we know that every state is looking at this right now. What do you think Indiana is doing or can do to have an edge over what other states are offering? So that's that's a great question. Um, well, first, let me start off by saying, Ryan, thank you for your presentation. I uh, learned a lot and uh, really appreciate uh, you. You, you talking to us about that. Um, so how, what can give Indiana the edge? Well, so uh, I've heard Elaine Beadle, who is the director of our uh, Destination Development Corporation, um, sort of a newer agency that's a modification of our state tourism uh, agency. And she was saying that they're doing a lot of research and what we can do to attract people to, to visit Indiana and to live in Indiana. And uh, working with these consultants, what they've learned is that Indiana doesn't have a bad reputation. It doesn't have a good reputation. It really has no reputation, no identity. And so um, what we need to do is do a better job of marketing ourselves. Uh, low cost of living, you know, we have beaches, we have the ability for people to go skiing here, it might not be the, the Rocky Mountains, but you can go skiing, our lakes, our natural resources. Um, Indiana has just about everything, professional sports teams, everything that you, you, you might want, um, but we just don't do a very good job of, of marking ourselves. So what we're trying to do is give our local communities more tools in the to toolbox to market themselves, um, you know, tell people why they have an edge over other communities and other states that someone who's looking to relocate, why they should move to Wayne County uh, or Evansville or whatever the case may be. So also to go along with that, a question is if we're saying we are going to incentivize individuals who are thinking about moving out of the state or out of the area to stay. How, how do you control that? How do you control someone saying, yeah, I'm going to move if you don't give me $5,000 toward my college debt or when they really have no intention? So, or do we start putting those thoughts in people's minds? So how do we control that in a way that's positive and works? So the way that the bill is set up is that the program, the workforce fund is managed by a five member board of managers who are appointed by the executive, um, the mayor, for example. And so it's, it's incumbent upon those five individuals to vet applicants. It's not, we're not saying that everyone who, apl who applies for an incentive gets an incentive. Uh, in fact, everyone who gets an incentive doesn't necessarily get the same incentive. 
There's a lot of discretion at the local level uh, to, to whom the board of managers uh, engages in, in, in um, executes an incentive agreement, which is uh, required for the program. Great, that makes sense. So similar to vetting a business um, incentive, this would be vetting individual incentives. Exactly, exactly. Great. Um, Roxy, any questions in the queue? There aren't any yet, but if you have any, please drop them in the chat box or send me a private message. Well, if I could add on from at least a national perspective, I mean, what we're seeing across this country is uh, unfortunate. I mean, we're seeing record setting labor shortages and that's happening for a degree of reason. One, the birth rate is significantly down. We're seeing earlier retirement. You know, people are adjusting their lives, having gone through and are still going through the pandemic where people are just not returning to work. So what are the ways that we can improve in doing that? First is a reform, our immigration reform. There has always been a gang of something in Washington where we've seen bipartisan pieces of legislation move forward, particularly to increase our worker visa program. There are people that want to get into the U.S. legally to help all of our industries thrive and continue to grow. Uh, it's also working with uh, our, our, our states and working with our state chambers and different talent pipeline solutions. Uh, but I'll tell you what, it, an easy result uh, for Indiana to continue to gain workers is uh, for the city calling you that I'm in right now in Chicago is for Chicago to keep doing what it's doing because people are fleeing here to head over to you all. We're seeing that, we appreciate that. Yes, yes. Um, so in regard to the supply chain issues that we're dealing with, I know one of the initiatives from the federal that has been trickling down to state level is broadband and the expansion of reliable broadband to um, regions such as Wayne County where we have a lot of gaps. Um, one question that surfaced in a conversation yesterday had to do with this high demand of increased fiber and incentives for um, providers to expand fiber is the potential and expectation that there is going to be a shortage of fiber. Is there anything that's being done and that either of you are aware of to ensure that when things like this happen, that there is the appropriate supply to meet the demand on these infrastructure um, incentives? Well, first, as it relates to the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure plan that passed, very large piece of legislation and obviously a key component to it was you know, broadband uh, deployment, particularly in the rural areas. But as a result of it, it's really difficult to tell how implementation is going to work. Right now it's working, going through federal regulators and how they're actually going to get broadband out into rural areas. And so that's something that we're monitoring very closely. Um, but there's another issue on top of the, or that's kind of beginning to bubble up with the horizon. And, are on the horizon and that's how 5G is really going to affect uh, our networks moving forward. We're already seeing a lot of complications, uh, particularly as it relates to the, the airline industry and seeing issues potentially how that, that affects planes taking off. So it's really a whole new world and digital uh, new age that we're in, but it's something that we at the chamber are definitely focused on, but there's really little specifics of how deployment of it's going to work. Thank you. Yeah, I'll so just add, I'll, oh, I'll go ahead, Brad. Adam. I'll add to that. Um, I think we it's also we just need to look at alternatives to fiber. Um, this is this touchy issue because you know um, Indiana has invested in in broadband uh, expansion of broadband, but has uh, excluded state spending on satellite broadband, and I think that. Um, if we're really going to identify ways to get the best bang for our buck, sort of all options need to be on the table. 
Absolutely. So we do have a question in the queue. Roxy, do you want to um, read us the question? Absolutely. This is from Jeff Carter. Currently, the state focus appears to be on regions and or communities with growing populations. As an eastern gateway to Indiana with a declining population, how might Wayne County gain greater interest and investment on the state level? And are there particular bills which might improve our situation? Broadband investment is one example. And are there things we can do outside of population growth that might demonstrate partnership possibilities? Yeah, I can, um, I can address this. I mean, I, I think that the, the, um, the bill that I just mentioned, Senate Bill 4, giving, giving uh, Wayne County more tools in the toolbox to attract talent and use, use existing funds is one thing, but also, um, you know, the, the ready grant program uh, that the state appropriated $500 million last year, um, there's already talk about uh, another round of ready in 2023. So I think it's identifying those regional partners now and putting together a very comprehensive plan above and beyond what's already part of the existing plan. So that if and when money becomes available for another round of ready, uh, you're, you're in a better position to receive the full amount, which is going to take, uh, you know, matching funds from uh, folks on this call and from employers, uh, really it's a all hands on deck um, opportunity. So I want to be respectful of your time and I know we had intended to wrap this up at 10 o'clock. Um, we do have another question in the queue. Would you like to answer that now or do we want to follow up outside of this meeting? Uh, it was really across. Um, so the question is about the, um, the, work, the worker and workforce surveys. Um, it was across, uh, across industries. Um, Brenda, if you want to reach out to me um, I can get your contact information from Melissa or vice versa, and I'll get you sort of um, a better breakdown of, of who is that, uh, the respondents that were asked. Great, thanks. Well, as I mentioned, we will um, put this recording on our YouTube channel and share it out, and we'll make sure we send an email to all of you so you have the link. And um, Ryan and Adam, if you're open to sharing your slide decks, we'll share those as well. And then if you have any other questions, we'll be happy to put you in touch with, with Ryan um, or Adam and his team at the state. And I just wanna say how much we appreciate having um, both Indiana and US Chamber working on behalf of businesses and making sure that things that move forward are um, pro business in 2022. Thank you all. Thank you all Thanks for joining for us. Thank you for your partnership. We'll look forward to seeing you all at the State House in a few weeks. Sounds great. Take care. Thank you all.